Amanath asked me to talk about experiments in the 1980s and I didn't really take him at his word. I decided to expand it a bit into the 70s and a little bit into the 90s. Um, these are all pictures. Uh, I can't say that Professor Kelly stole my thunder because it's his thunder. Um, a lot of these pictures are testament to the stories he's already told. So um, let's get into them. And the one of the things that you can do when you're down the order a bit is um, add an extra slide in before you get up. Um, this was one that wasn't in my talk until Jim was talking this morning. But... Uh, New Zealand was an exotic place back in the day, <laughs> and that's how Jim got there <laughs> uh, for his sabbatical uh, in 1971, um, venturing deep into the South Pacific. He came back and did this. Um, this was that first three-story frame, and it was actually a frame, as he said, it existed already. It was a frame that uh, Clough and Hucklebridge are put together for looking at uplift. But what was done, of course, was to uh, augment the uplift by putting the energy dissipation devices in that Jim talked about. They look like this. Uh, when we go across to the shake table lab, uh, you can actually see this very one, one of the ones that were tested uh, in the early 1970s. And there, there's the railroad viaduct, railway viaduct, as it would be called in New Zealand. Uh, that is the tall stepping frame that was the direct um, lineage out of this shake table testing and Jim's evolution of the torsion beam device. So that was done even before the building, uh, before there were any uh, isolation tests. And this was the first, the same frame again, same three-story frame. I think less than a year later, John can speak to this. I see him nodding, so I got it right, because John worked with Jim and did these experiments. The bearings were rudimentary, um, would be a, a polite way of describing them. They're prehistoric, perhaps. Uh, thin layers of rubber individually bonded to steel plates and then when you built up a small little sub-assembly you start building another one and when you got enough of them you bolt them all together and you call them an isolation bearing. They were adventurous and creative and innovative and pioneering. Not only did they put the building on bearings and shake it around um, but they looked at adding different types of energy dissipation, putting in uh, breakaway systems to investigating shear pins and the like to address wind resistance. All the essential components of an isolation system were done in the original experiments. And there's that result. The first plots that ever appeared in an EERC report um, that showed how much attenuation was provided by putting a building on isolation bearings rather than fixing it to the ground. And it seems commonplace these days to be talking about it, but it had never been done. And these, these were the first results that from experiment demonstrated the efficacy of the concept. And I came across this slide, and John's going to have to say something <laughs> about this at the end, because this slide to me is remarkable. Uh, it, uh, I have these pictures because recently I had the opportunity to, to digitize some of Jim's slides. And uh, this image, and I think any write-up about it, doesn't appear anywhere in an EERC report. But they did it. What did they do? They added a shock absorber device in parallel with the rubber bearing to create an enhanced isolation system. And in 2022 now in the United States and in many places, it's probably regarded, maybe not always a rubber bearing, it might be a friction pendulum bearing, but putting a large viscous damping device in parallel with the bearing might be regarded as perhaps the apex of a highly configured, high-performing isolation system. And John and Professor Kelly and others, with help from others, did it in their first ever experiments in the mid-1970s, quite remarkable. 
Dan Chitty. Dan Chitty. Actually, Dan's going to feature in my very, very last slide. <laughs> I'm going to show you. So things moved on. This is late 70s, early 80s. This is uh, Professor Kelly talked about uh, reusing frames, and I'm going to emphasize that in a few more slides. Um, this is half of a nine-story building. This is um, the large frame that Hucklebridge and Clough used for their uh, uplift stepping frame work. This was uh, used for a whole host of different bearing tests. Here are those neoprene bearings on the left that Professor Kelly talked about. Uh, different types of damping devices here. Tapered plate device was used with this frame. Uh, the steam generator, Professor Kelly mentioned, uh, work related to the electric power industry. This was work supported by EPRI. I've got the mic on. I, I won't repeat that. <laughs> if you got it, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> so there, no isolation here, um, but energy, power plant, components inside structures. Here's the, the same three-story frame again, fixed to the table with a piping system inside it. In the steam generator experiment, there were tapered plate dissipators. There's a little one next door. Maybe this one here you can pick up and see. Uh, in the pipe frame system, they used X plates that went on to become called ADAS, to become uh, known as ADAS devices and were used in a number of buildings uh, in the US and Mexico. And a quick detour to the building next door. This is not the shake table, but it was happening at exactly the same time. The bearings got quick, bigger very quickly. This was 1983, July 1983, and these were the tests of the prototype bearings for the Foothill Communities building, the first isolated building in the US. Resolution's not great there, but there's a cameo of um, uh, Hugh McNiven in the, in the lower right there, who is one of the former EERC directors. And entirely uncoordinated with uh, Professor Buckle, but some of the same images. Here's the bridge deck test and the skew on the table. Now, moving on, this is uh, mid-80s. Uh, this is the, the Hucklebridge 9 Clough, Hucklebridge 9-story uh, frame on the table. This is in the isolated configuration where we investigated several different types of isolation system, including combinations of rubber and sliding bearings. Um, this is the frame that we pushed hard to make it uplift on the bearings. Uh, and other work was done also with other research, other um, PhD students of Jim's, uh, with tanks, putting water tanks on the table and in the isolated building. So we really maximized um, the use of the time on the table. A bit hard to see in this picture, but it it was sort of the may, maybe the heyday or the the height of activity in the lab. There's a there's a veritable traffic jam of model buildings here. In the far right is uh, far, far right corner is a, a six-story uh, setback frame. This was one of uh, this was a experiments by Professor Maley and a PhD student. Uh, a reinforced concrete frame, the nine-story frame on the table, and on the left and the right, um, uh, two U.S. Japan models of Professor Botero, uh, the concrete seven-story concrete frame on the left and the six-story steel frame on the right. Um, I think that there, there's 27 stories of model buildings in here. I don't know how the staff ever got them in the back door, let alone moved them around. Um, here are those two U.S. Botero, U.S. Japan models. Um, one of the common threads all through the years has been reuse of models. Um, even ad hoc reuse, you know, they're left sitting around outside the back and you get your hooks into them to use them economically for the next round of experiments. Uh, this, in this case, the building on the left had started life as a special concentric brace frame. It got turned into an EBF and here it's being used. It was subsequently used for friction damper tests. The building on the right was a seven-story frame. If you count stories there, it's six. Um, after Botero used it to investigate wall frame interaction, it had the bottom chopped off and we isolated it and it was reused to uh, investigate isolation. 
The same story frame again, this time fixed to the table. This is in the mid 80s. Uh, and a whole series of experiments were done investigating uh, dissipation systems, two types of friction dampers uh, and viscoelastic dampers here. Um, a lot of threads to icons and people, pioneers in the, in the field of structural engineering. The viscoelastic damper work we did with uh, a research scientist at 3M, uh, Pavis Mahmoudi, who was a, a co-patent holder with Les Robertson, uh, because they had developed this original configuration, just like you see here, uh, to use in the original World Trade Center towers. And we work with Pavis to uh, adapt and extend the viscoelastics into the seismic realm. The adaption was not, not trivial because in the World Trade Center they had the dampers moving about 1 or 2 percent shear strain under wind. We needed to go two orders of magnitude higher up to a couple of hundred percent and the work was um, uh, pioneering in the nine-story frame and it paralleled other work that had been done at about the same time at Buffalo in smaller experimental structures. So the last uh, model I'm going to show is this one, early 90s. It was done before the, the last experiment, I think, that was done before the shake table started to be ripped apart and turned into a six degree of freedom table. Um, it was a huge investigation that was associated with um, a milestone pair of, or landmark pair of buildings in Japan. Uh, Shimizu Corporation had built two demonstration buildings, twin buildings at Tohoku University, uh, one isolated, one not, uh, and use them basically as uh, field benchmarks to observe the behavior of the isolated buildings out in the wild. Um, we built a two-fifth scale model and did extensive tests on it on the table with different types of isolation systems, also pushing it to the extent that we were getting inelastic behavior significant inelastic behavior in the reinforced concrete superstructure. So Ian Buckle showed a bearing tipped over and here's a few pictures. I think they really speak to the um, enthusiasm and the aggressiveness <laughs> of people in the early days willing to push things to the limit and beyond. These weren't necessarily bearings that had, well, obviously they failed. They worked, but it wasn't enough for the researchers that they worked. They wanted to know what happened if you went too far. And they were willing to go too far with large and heavy models on the shake table to see what happened. Um, as, as Ian Buckle said, largely without hard hats or any other forms of <laughs> special protection. Uh, here's another bearing uh, toppled over under extreme loading. And I think this may even be the same image that Ian showed of the bridge uh, deck model rolled over. It was only about a decade later, uh, slightly more, uh, when we were able to do this. And it was dem a testament to how far the technology came and how quickly it advanced. Where bearings could be stretched and sheared so far that we actually couldn't break them on the table anymore. It was a, a remarkable and rapid evolution in technical development. These last pictures are just to speak to the tasks of graduate students back in the day. You know, most of these experiments were done without video, and they were certainly done without, you know, the, the convenience of video in our pockets and high-res cameras on our phones in our pockets. And one of the things we were always tasked to do was to try to snap a shot of a bearing during an earthquake experiment when it was deformed. And we always managed to do it with varying degrees of success and failure, but here's three examples of little bearings on the table is snapped in the midst of, of building shaking. Yeah, a couple more words about how things have advanced and changed. Um, these, along with doing things on the table, was the interest in characterizing the bearings uh, under quasi-static loading, put a, put a compression load on them and shear them. Um, you can't really make out, but it's a hydraulic jack running off a hand pump um, to pull the thing sideways in one direction and, and measure, observe um, 
compression and lateral characteristics. Less than 20 years later, the bearings had grown in size and the abilities to test had grown so much. This is one of just four actuators on the machine in San Diego that are used to test bearings. Um, and this, this one actuator that Jim's standing beside has a 5,000 GPM primary stage on the servo valve. So we went from pulling bearings sideways with little hydraulic hand jacks to, in less than two decades to testing them with quite extraordinary sophisticated equipment. So back to the shake table lab, and this will be familiar to Don. I see him nodding sagely <laughs> at the picture of the, the 2D analog controller. Span um, yes, yeah, span 100, span 250. <laughs> if you were adventurous, it was 750. Um, and in the lower right, the, the rack of uh, signal analysis equipment, uh, signal power conditioning and uh, data acquisition. And just a comment to extending on uh, Khalid's observation of nearly a thousand reports from the early 1970s to the late 1990s and the, the concentration and the high quality of the data and the information in those reports. There's a tape drive that you may be able to see there in the, in the lower right. That tape drive was how the data was archived. When I came to work on the table, I think each tape was 25 megabytes. Um, it means, uh, I counted the tapes in the cabinet there. The cabinet, which has probably got, a, it might have a couple of years of experiments on it, has probably got 20% of the storage of the RAM. <laughs> that's in my phone now exists in that in that cabinet full of data that represented year, several years of experiments. Jim mentioned the name Dan Chitty, that's someone that John would have worked with in the early days and here's Dan, uh, I think it's appropriate as a black and white photo, uh, graduate student standing in front of that uh, acquisition and control system and the thing I like most about the picture, it's a great picture, but a reminder that in the beginning of isolation shake table research, the sh grad students were in the lab with slide rules <laughs> in their top pockets. <laughs> so back to the shake table. Um, I think it's remarkable that something that was a one-fifth scale proof of concept model that was implemented 50 years ago exists today and is meaningful today. It was pretty spare underneath originally. There were just a few bits of hydraulics to make the thing work. And in the mid 90s, after we I, I mentioned that experiment, it was pulled apart and they stuffed about as much hydraulics and accumulators and hard line pipe work in as was possible to enhance it to six degrees of freedom. It's testament to the vision of those uh, who who created the idea and, and realized it originally. I think that's Dixon, who um, Anil mentioned standing on the platform there. And it's testament, too, to everyone who's worked on it and supported it and kept it going and enhanced it. People like Don here who's sitting in the front row over all the years. And it's still meaningful today. I, it's a remarkable testament to everyone involved. That's what I've got. Thank you.